The Rolling Stones had a theory. It was tried. They published it. It was tried. It didn't work. I've spoken on many campuses. You tell the kids in school that their theory is as good as someone else's, and boy, you get theories. Every so often you hear a new one. Call a lab, ask them to try it. Nothing worked. What I'm saying is that nobody was rejected based on how old they were or who they were. One theory is as good as another, yet nothing worked. Up until October of 1981, there was only one theory that almost everybody could buy. It was a statement made in one of the world's biggest laboratories. The image on the Shroud of Turin could only have been produced by what may turn out, ultimately, to have been the greatest burst of radiant energy ever known to man, possibly exceeding even that of a nuclear bomb, emanating uniformly from every pore of the man's body, from the inside out, in a millisecond of time. I once timed a strobe light at an airport at nine times a second. This would have been a thousand. In a thousandth of a second, or less, producing a temperature that one man estimated had to have been in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Enough in a millisecond to scorch the cloth, but not destroy it. Undoubtedly, this would be the experience the Christians normally call the resurrection. Bong! Except I've got to say, how do you duplicate the resurrection in a laboratory? <laughs> That's our problem. Now, I've got no way to prove why. I stick my neck out every time I say it. I'm some kind of a biblical fundamentalist. I don't know what kind. I haven't figured that out yet. But uh, I'm some kind. Primarily because science has yet to disprove even one story in the Bible. It looks as if uh, there's evidence that maybe there was a man and a woman named Adam and Eve. Maybe. There's a boat on top of a mountain in the desert. We know what the, the mechanics of the flood were all about. The Bible even seems to talk about the point in time when the con continental drift began, and it looks as if a couple of men, one from the University of Pennsylvania, the other either Illinois or, Indi or Indiana, have just uncovered Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain. And we can even tell you how a woman could, or a man, could conceivably be turned into something that resembles a pillar of salt in only one spot on earth that anyone knows of where the conditions are geologically correct. And because those stories appear to have been at least tied down pretty good. I'll, I can buy the rest of them, the ones we can't prove. Because of that, I'm not hanging anything on anybody, but I'm only saying where I'm coming from, and I wish I could explain them to you. But uh, because of that, because that's the way I think, I've had to look at every theory that anyone has ever come up with for the image-producing mechanism on the Shroud of Turin with those eyes. Because if anything were to contradict that story I've told you this evening, this isn't Jesus. I have my Biblio with me. About every fourth word is nailed down. It's withstood a great deal of scrutiny. What you've heard tonight is historical fact. If anything were to have contradicted, I'd never believe that this was Jesus. Even if it did, I'd want to be part of it. There's one Jewish genius traveling the world with a set of slides and a light pointer saying, what's a good Jewish boy like me doing working on a Catholic relic? My family tells me I'm crazy. I tell them, you find me a better game and you can deal me in. In the meantime, I'm going to play in this one. Me too. It's the best game in town. But nothing has contradicted it, and it's too late for it to happen now. But only one theory fits in, and no, we cannot prove it. We may never prove it. But suppose someday, and it's happened in the past, every telephone in the United States and England all go off at the same time. Some lab is screaming, you won't believe what we just found. You nope, never do. You just check it. Suppose this time, we've got the frequency. Now we can talk about it. Radiant energy. It doesn't have to be thermonuclear. Those lights are radiant energy. If you don't believe it, come up here and stand with me. So is sunlight, x-ray. But almost every single time when it occurs in a burst, it's accompanied by a brilliant white light, a flash, a glare, a burst of white light, something that's going to light up the entire sky. With or without a mushroom cloud, with or without sound, that white light is there just about every time. And sure, I believe in angels. I can tell you angel stories from now until tomorrow afternoon. I know too many people who have seen them and talked to them. And these kids wouldn't dare lie. They're scared. I've been present when they were. As I said, I've got loads of stories. I just don't believe that at that hour before dawn, before the Jewish women showed up, and incidentally, the, the Bible does say that four writers tell us that the women saw angels. I don't believe that at that hour before the Jewish women showed up that the Romans saw an angel. I think that what they saw was the mechanics, the cause and effect of the resurrection how the father went about raising his son, and they did not have the vocabulary with which to describe it. The term radiant, radiant energy did not exist in the first century. 
Is it possible that we know too much about it? Is it possible that the Roman legion told Matthew that there was a tremendous burst of white light, the stone went sailing over their heads, Jesus came out, and because the women had seen angels and Matthew believed the women, maybe he thought the Romans did? I don't know. But try this on for size. A Middle Eastern night. There's no pollution in southern Israel even today. There are nights when the stars are bigger than saucers. No rain at this time of year. Dead silence. Nobody in their right mind would go anywhere near the garden. The body very thoroughly dead, wrapped in a sheet, lying on some kind of a slab. The Romans were not asleep. Polybius said, and he was no Christian, that they would be checked every hour and a half maximum by a centurion to make sure that they were awake and on duty. They would probably have been bored to, to tears, but they had been leaning on their spears looking for trouble. Suddenly something, and science has no hope of ever proving what it was. One nuke said, give it up. We just don't understand the physics of a miracle. Something within the bo that body triggers the most unbelievable burst of radiant energy ever known. Instantaneously heated to something over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, any nuke is going to tell you that the air in that tomb, which should have been cold and stale and dead and damp after three days of being sealed up, heated that high, that rapidly, would have to expand at least three to five PSI, pounds per square inch. They'll also tell you that that's the principle of a nuclear bomb, that that mountain would vanish and take most or all of Jerusalem, Jerusalem along with it, if the tomb were tightly corked. But it wasn't. That huge boulder at the mouth of the tomb would have been like a paper cap on the end of a glass milk bottle. That seismus, and this is a legitimate translation which no one could possibly have made before 1979, that shock wave or that thermal wind would have hit that rock and lifted it right over the head of the Roman god. Of course they went catatonic. They froze. They became like dead men. <laughs> so would every man in this room, including me, when something like that happened. Then when he came walking out of the tomb, apparently they became non-catatonic. They began to put one foot in front of the other just as rapidly as they could do it, and who wouldn't? They checked out of that piece of real estate. And it's interesting that the pride of the Roman legion did not report to their own centurion in Antonia. They checked in with a Jewish high priest. Now someone said there's two good reasons. Number one, who wants to get converted to instantaneous dog food? Number two, when something like that happens, you find the nearest priest, regardless of what his denomination is. You got problems. Over the centuries, theologians have often said that the Gospel writer John had a horrible Greek vocabulary. He had picked the wrong word to describe the movement of the stone. Until today, no translator ever considered the legitimate translation wind. There was never a wind big enough to move a 3,000 pound rock. There isn't a person in this room tonight who, who could deny that there is such a wind. You cannot ignore that translation anymore. It's at least got to be checked out. They never knew what to, uh, to do with the word Aero that John used to describe the movement of the stone. Until today, a seismist could only roll a stone that big. Aero has no connotation to roll. It means picked up, lifted, moved, physically carried, or sailed away. Today, it looks as if John's vocabulary wasn't that bad, because wherever the stone came down, it sure as heck was not next to the entrance of the tomb. And that's the shroud. And what does it mean? If you're like me, Pastor A, the only people I really know in this room, nothing. I didn't need this cloth six years ago. I don't need it today. To risk an extremely lousy pun, my faith isn't all wrapped up in a sheet. But I was traveling over in the city, New York, not long ago with one of the team. I don't want to identify him. Let him tell his own story. It, but just accept, if you can, the fact that you can read his name in every encyclopedia in the world today. Somewhere along that rather wild ride, the man with me said, Paul, all of our lives we've worshipped a God called science. We believed only what we could see and what we could touch, nothing more. All of a sudden now, it's our God, science, that's saying that Jesus is Lord. And what in heck do you do with that? He said, it isn't that we want to believe, but either we have to accept the fact that it's not us, it's our equipment that's saying that this is Jesus of Nazareth and he was resurrected. Or we have to scrap the most sophisticated equipment the world has, unless Russia's got something better and we doubt it. Because it's not us, it's the equipment. And if that's true, this whole thing's like a computer, one, one, two, two, and two, four. If that's true, it doesn't mean a blessed thing what my wife believes. It's what the heck am I going to do with it? Well, he did. I prayed with him.